Hello, everybody. I'm Brent Durand with Atlantis Dive Resorts and Liveaboards in the Philippines. So hope you're all having a good time and enjoying Scuba Digital and getting to network with some folks and learn a lot about um, the different destinations and resorts and dive operators and manufacturers and the exciting stuff that is, is part of the conference. So welcome. Um, what I'm going to talk about here are some photography tips for dive in the Philippines. Um, so my role with Atlantis is handling um, sales and group sales on the west coast of the United States. So, so um, yeah, uh, that's what I'm doing, talking to, to a lot of dive shops and helping uh, with our groups and everything um, that are coming to the resorts. So throughout this conversation, I'd like to have this more of a conversation versus a, a singular presentation. So feel free to leave comments in the, the stage chat area. Um, so I'll be able to see those and we can answer questions as we go and as I talk through some of these photo tips and um, tricks and all these other things for the Philippines. So basically, let me get the slides moving here. Um, does this subject move me to feel, to think, and to dream? And I like to always open with a quote for these photography talks because creating great images isn't just pointing and clicking and swimming on. You know, you, you need to stop. You need to be cognizant and really be aware of the fact you're creating an image. Even start to try and connect with the, the marine life or the marine subject or conduct your whole dive in a way that you're looking for the perfect composition. So these are the things that are always in, in my head and in a lot of photographers' heads. And when you start thinking about this and having that f-stop um, field of view and that f-stop mindset, you'll really start creating great images versus pointing, clicking, and swimming fast. So going, going for um, uh, sorry, I'm reading the comments here. But um, so in the Philippines, basically we have a, a big country. There's seven thousand one hundred and seven islands that goes up or down depending on the tide, high tide or low tide. So you'll see that right here um, in the center of the screen. So a lot of different islands. And what that does is that allows for a lot of currents and tides to move through this area. Um, the Philippines is at the top of the, uh, the Coral Triangle. So that is known as a, the center of the ocean's marine biodiversity. So the Philippines and particularly some areas like the Verde Island Passage, where one of the Atlantis resorts is in Puerto Galera, is known as the center of the center of the ocean's biodiversity. So what that means is we have just unparalleled amounts of hard corals and soft corals and reef life and reef fish and big schools of fish down to the crabs and the, the, um, the urchins, the shrimp and all that sort of thing. Just you go on these dives and there's nonstop uh, marine life, you know, as you're going and as you're diving through this. So it really creates pretty much unparalleled photo opportunities if you're looking for that smaller type marine life. Um, and with Atlantis, we have two different resorts and a liveaboard boat. Um, so that really gives us the opportunity to dive and shoot photos with a wide variety of subjects, a wide variety of habitats. Um, and really create those, those images. So our first resort is down south of Manila a bit here in Porta Galera. So that's, yeah, so that is about a uh, two, two and a half hour drive um, south from Manila. And then you do a, an hour by boat and then you're at the resort here in Porta Galera with a great variety of diving, um, reefs to macro to shipwreck to world famous Verde Island. We do as a day trip. Um, so really, really fantastic, well-rounded diving. Then also in Dumaguete down here in the southern area of the country, we have our other resort. And that is just really, really fantastic macro diving. So I compare it, it's, you know, arguably one of the, or arguably the best macro spot in the world up there with um, Lembe Strait, Tulum and Bali and places like that. Just the, the amount of critters you're going to see on these dives is just, just mind blowing. Um, then on top of that, we have our liveaboard boat, the Azores, which moves around the country depending on the time of year. So it will embark and disembark from Porta Galera during the first part of the year and dive the shipwrecks of Caron and Apo Reef. Then we do Tubataha, which is one of those bucket list type trips you absolutely have to do at some point. And then we also do the Visayas. We have a couple, couple different itineraries there that embark and disembark out of our Dumaguete Resort. So it makes it really easy to do a combo trip with the resorts and also with the liveaboard for great diving and photo opportunities. So we do this a lot with Atlantis. 
we have camera rooms at both resorts and we host a lot of different photographers. So a lot of the pro photographers are coming year over year and they can choose to go anywhere. Why do they choose to come to the Philippines and Atlantis and our destinations? You know, I, I think that says a lot in itself just for the photo opportunities and the quality of service that we provide. So let's let's get into it. Let's go from uh, a little baby Yoda to a grandmaster with her photography. And there's two things I want to focus on today. The first is going to be composition for both macro and for wide angle. And then the second will be touching on exposure and your histogram and how to use that to ensure you're getting proper exposure in your images, which is very, very important. I actually just filmed a video about that on my YouTube channel um, three, four weeks ago. So I definitely think it's really important in creating great images. So our first macro tip is to get close to your subject and to fill the frame. Earlier on, I alluded to just swimming over your subject, pointing, clicking, and swimming along down the reef. And that's not what we want to do to create compelling macro images. So we want to get really, really close to the subject. And when we get close to the subject, we're making the subject appear larger in the frame. We're filling the frame with the subject. And that's what we really want to capture a lot of the great detail to create depth and to create great color and really crisp images um, for macro. The more water we shoot through, the more particulate and the more haze that's going to be inherent in our images, the flatter the image is going to look. You can have a million megapixels and crop, you know, 3000% into this tiny little thing, but you're going to lose so much detail, so much of the good color and the contrast by doing that. So you want to get very close to your subject and that's going to create those compelling compositions that keep a lot of great detail in your images. So here's a great example with our buddy Nemo here, everyone's favorite fish. I should say a lot of people's favorite fish to be fair. Um, so I'm looking for that. I'm trying to fill the frame with the subject. Then also here's a uh, shallow depth of field. We've got a, a leaf scorpion fish here. And regardless of what creative aspects I'm trying to do, I'm trying to fill the frame. I wanna make sure that the subject is really taking up a lot of space in the frame to create that really great detail. Then here we go. We've got a male ornate ghost pipefish. And a fun fact is you can look towards the tail. You might be able to see my mouse here. And the males will have a smaller tail here or smaller on um, pectoral fins. And then the female will have larger pectoral fins and that's where the, uh, the eggs are stored in between those fins. So, so really, really fun subject. And again, it just fills the frame right here. In terms of a little bit of composition, you've probably heard of the rule of thirds and you can draw a line down here, rule of thirds and a line down here, rule of thirds. So it settles into that nice composition and that will happen automatically with a lot of your photos, um, particularly for macro, when you're getting close to the subject. You'll find that you're inherently composing towards a lot of these rules, like the rule of thirds. So it all starts to play in nicely with each other once you start keeping this stuff in mind as you're composing your scene. And here we go. We've got a, a network pipefish. So these are really, really fun subjects. And you've got a long, narrow subject. How do you fill a frame with that? Well, you, you always want that eye contact. You want to be close towards the face of the subject. So I got close to the face of the subject and just had some of the, the body come out the side of the frame, uh, out through the top of the frame. And that still gives you the detail. It fills a frame. And I have some extra space here as a bit of swim space that the subject will move into versus uh, cropping the image too close towards its nose or its mouth. You know, that's not something we, we generally want to go for in our images. So a bit unique and different situation versus a big fat subject, but this is how you'd fill the frame with something like this. So the next tip, number two for macro. So this is to meet your subject on their level. Now this is pretty similar to fill your frame, but a bit different. Whereas you can fill the frame by shooting up above or a, at a 45 degree angle to your subject and things like that um, to, to really create a compelling composition with marine life and all animals actually that your viewer will engage with. Um, you want to get down on their level. If you're shooting from above, it looks like you're shooting from above and you're just swimming over it. There's no eye con less chance of eye contact and it's just not as dynamic an image. So by getting very low and in close to your subject, now you're really getting in there and you're starting to see the depth. You're starting to get a better feel and sense of the habitat where the critter lives and you feel like you're part of that scene, which really gets exciting. 
and it'll excite your viewers as well. They're going to say, wow, I, I don't even know what that is. I haven't been in that perspective before. So that's really what we're going for in terms of um, getting low and meeting the subject. So here's just an example of, uh, I think, a flatfish down here. And not great shots. It's very camouflage subject. But just look through myself, uh, these photos, as I started to figure out how best to, to shoot this type of subject where you can't see it, can't really see it. OK, I'm getting closer. Now I'm getting closer and lower. Now I'm close and a lot lower. And I can even see the eye of the subject. So that's really important there. Um, you know, to, to make this subject stand out more, you can use a snoot or various things like that. But you can see just in these examples how getting low and close will really, really help create a much more dynamic composition. Um, one thing to note as well is in the first image of the series, you'll see that um, everything is in focus. A lot of the sand grains are in focus too. But by the time I get down and get low, I'm shooting in a, a long orientation towards from the front of the subject towards the back of the subject. And then you'll notice the out of focus blur in the background, that bokeh. Um, not a pretty bokeh in this instance, but that's where you start to create that bokeh. And by making the background blurred, your subject starts to pop and stand out a bit more as well versus um, you know shooting down on top of the sand too. So that's a nice um, added benefit towards getting in the, the subject's face. So here's a goby on top of a, a whip coral, or actually that looks like a, a sea pen, sorry. So you know we're down there, we're on its level and shooting in, getting that nice uh, crisp detail and that, that face portrait. Another one, here's a lizard fish. So lots of lizard fish all over the Indo-Pacific. You've probably seen photos of lizard fish with other fish in their mouth and things like that. Um, but how do you get a, another camouflage fish that is on the sand, in this case, dark sand? Um, and how do you make that stand out from the background? Same thing, got very low camera, you know, basically on the sand here, make sure there's nothing below and then in close and then can shoot in from this perspective. Like the example before, we've got some out of focus uh, bokeh and blurred background behind it, which also helps make the subject stand out more. So another side effect of shooting down in that, um, in that uh, environment of the subject. And here's a classic one as well our uh, chromodors, um, chromodors, is that a chromodors? Um, new to Brank here, but classic. It's um, the white body with these orange rhinophores, um, the branchial plume back here. Um, this is a classic example of getting low, getting close and filling the frame with the subject. Um, and you can't get more iconic than this new to Brank in the Philippines. And same for big subjects too. So now we're kind of outside of the macro realm into just um, close and filling the frame here and getting down low at the subject. But this, this technique works for larger subjects. So whether it's this or a turtle or anything of that size, you know, get down on its perspective and you really start to make that photo stand out. We're in its space. Okay, speaking about space, um, negative space versus waste space. Now, I really differentiate between these two because it's really important when you're composing your scene and trying to figure out, you know, oftentimes, with, particularly with a compact camera, you might not be able to get close to, to a subject. You're limited by your camera's minimum focus distance, which means you can only get so close and fill the frame so much before you have to crop to make the photo tighter. So you might find that sometimes, um, even if it's a very small subject and you've got an interchangeable lens camera with a very powerful macro lens, you know, 100, 105 millimeters, a Sony 90 millimeter, uh, or any powerful macro lens like that. So keep these, these tips in mind as we go through here. Um, wasted space. So what is wasted space? Essentially, that is a lot of stuff around the fringes of the frame that doesn't add to the scene. There's no real benefit to seeing all this kind of mess of this fire urchin here around the Coleman shrimp. It doesn't add to the scene. Instead, we should try and get close and eliminate some of that clutter and that wasted space to make the best use of the frame and really uh, try and create a, a, a dynamic frame with, with the subjects. So this is getting close to do that. Here's another example now with this, uh, this porcelain crab. Um, and what I've done is I have intentionally left negative space above it. So you'll see that it's perched on top of the soft coral. It's looking up. It's probably using it, it, it filter feeding, you know, whisking little particulate out of the water, little bits of food. Um, so what I wanted to emphasize here was black space above the subject. And it's not wasted because it's intentional. The subject's in the corner and it's looking up into that space. So I call that negative space, which is productive for the image and it contributes to the mood that I was going for with this particular image. 
Um, so difference between the wasted space that doesn't do a whole lot and then the negative space that really adds towards this interesting composition. Here's another example of negative space, which I think helps the image. We've got this, uh, this solar powered nudie here on top of a uh, Xenia coral um, right here. You can see those Xenia corals and how camouflaged this nudie is. And then the black space to the right of the subject here. So that's negative space. And I wanted to emphasize, um, this one was actually growing on a wall. So I wanted to emphasize just the open space um, to the right of it. while also trying to figure out how to differentiate this camouflage subject from its habitat. You know, this is um, a perfect example of symbiosis, right? It lives on the Xenia corals and they, you know, that helps protect it because it, it blends in. So how do you, how do you um, make the subject stand out in that, that environment? So the negative space does that in this case. Here's another example of negative space that adds to the image. And I feel that it creates depth with this uh, bubble coral and the bubble coral shrimp. Um, it, because of the composition and the shrimp opening up into the frame here and keeping some of these bubbles around to the right side, that really creates that depth that we want when we're looking at something like this, this bubble coral. If you see them, they're going to be on the sides of rocks or kind of down low towards holes in the rocky reef, and they'll be about this big with all their bubbles. Um, so they're really fun, really interesting to go and shoot. But, um, you know, they can appear really flat. So by, by creating a perspective like this and creating a lot of extra space on the open side of the subject here where it's looking, it, it adds that depth to the image and lets you show the habitat that this little shrimp lives in. Okay, so that is macro. Let's move on to some wide angle tips. So the Philippines has a lot of talk about the macro subjects because essentially the macro diving is unparalleled. But um, the wide angle is stunning as well. And you'll start to notice um, when you dive in the Indo-Pacific or various places in the Indo-Pacific, there are very distinct color palettes um, in these different regions. And you can see certain color palettes and be able to pinpoint, you know, the country, particularly with the Philippines and stuff like that. So it's really interesting and a fun place to do lots of uh, wide angle photography. So tip number one, find a strong, interesting subject. Now, this can be for a regular wide angle scene or something that we might call more of close focus wide angle, where you want to really get close to something on the reef, like this scene right here, we've got this blue sea star and then have a, a mid ground behind it. And then maybe a background like this blue water. You could even throw in a sunburst or a diver or something like that. But the idea is that you want to find something very compelling to anchor the frame and really serve as that, that well, that anchor that people will see first, and then it attracts their eye and leads their eye through the frame. Here's another example, and this one was actually shot at Apo Island off of uh, Dumaguete, where we have our, our resort down there. So lots of turtles there at Apo Island. It's one of the earliest examples of a marine preserve. Um, my colleague Ronnie actually did a presentation. Um, it might have been uh, yesterday, I think. Um, talking all about Apple Island and how it's been such a great example of an early uh, marine reserve in the world and in the Philippines. Um, and just the reef is stunning there all around the island. Lots of turtles, lots of green sea turtles. So really fun place. But this is a perfect strong anchor. Get a turtle. Everyone knows what a turtle is. They don't have to be a diver trying to figure out what cryptic subject you're shooting. Turtle looks good. People will stop their scrolling to look at your turtle because you've got that strong subject. Here we go. We've got a lionfish and lionfish are native in Indo-Pacific, so they are OK. They do have predators. Um, and this is just uh, another example here of trying to look for that color contrast. Instead of shooting this lionfish against the reef where it kind of blends in with the crinoids we see in some of the other uh, marine life, I got low, got under it. Um, and then shot it against the blue water. And that creates that, that strong color contrast that makes it a very strong subject to anchor in the scene. Here we go. We've got a barrel sponge growing amongst a bunch of soft corals. And this photo is actually um, outside of Porta Galera. So it's near the point there, um, which has really, really fantastic diving and some great soft corals um, you know, for, for the area there. Um, what do you do to create even more interest? I've got this barrel sponge. I felt it wasn't just enough. So I created a secondary anchor, a secondary subject with um, our dive guide. So he was happy to jump in here and model. And all of the guides at Atlantis are just so familiar with all this stuff. You can just look and kind of see and they'll see what you're doing. They'll hop in, no problem. 
Um, so this composition tends to work because we've got that dual subject and we've got the guide looking at the barrel sponge or looking close to it, which adds that other element of interest. So the second, and I did mention it right before, but look for color contrasts. Now this can be a personal preference too. I like very colorful, very bright photos. Um, I like my foregrounds to be very well exposed, um, maybe a little past the middle on the histogram, which we'll look at later. Um, and that's really one of my things. So there's lots of personal preferences and style, but color contrasts are something that I always go for. Again, an example here with the blue sea star. And here we go. So we've got a lot of different color. And these are some of these classic Philippines colors um, that you'll see you know, throughout the country when you're diving some of these reefs. Um, so really just good example of that pop and that color contrast. You've got the antheas dancing above the reef, which is just always fun. You'll notice if you go dive with them, particularly in areas like this or in hard coral beds, the chromis and the antheas will dance up. And then as you're breathing in and then you exhale, all your bubbles roar to the surface, they'll go back down into the reef. You start breathing in and you're quiet, all the fish come up, you exhale, the fish go back down. So really cool, you can actually play a symphony there if you start humming very slowly, but the fish will dance to your rhythm, which is pretty fun. Okay, and just another classic example. So looking at these antheas and that color contrast that they create with the blue-green type water here, and a lot of those, uh, those uh, tree corals in the background, those, those dark green corals. Okay, and another example here with some soft corals. So we've got that strong color contrast. Again, the white, lighter colored corals, and then we've got the blue water in the background. Okay, and tip number three for wide angle. So portrait orientation is powerful. And this is so simple, but it's something we don't do enough. Um, maybe you're just shooting your camera with one light source. It can be your dive torch or a video light, or maybe you have two strobes, but we all tend to get in this, this complacent mindset where we're just shooting and we shoot like this and we never turn the camera sideways. The thing is when you turn the camera sideways, you have to move the strobes sideways as well to light. And I actually have a whole video in my YouTube channel all about that, um, talking about strobe positioning, um, lots of different ones. I think it's 21 minutes long. So we really get into that. But the trick is to make sure to turn your camera in portrait orientation. And that, think about it, for a magazine, you wanna get a one page spread, boom, that's the perfect way to do it. You've got your full one page. You don't need to crop anything away and lose detail or data or image size. You can do large prints in this format. The other thing is with a lot of social media, look at Facebook and look at Instagram. The way to make your image largest um, as people are scrolling through those feeds is to crop by it with a four by five aspect ratio. So four by five. So if you're shooting vertical, now you can crop out less of the image in order to, to create that four by five that people will, will see as they're scrolling through their feeds. So here's one example here. We've got more of this classic Philippines color and fish. And then a couple more examples as well. So nice barrel sponge and some soft corals. Then we've got a sea crate right here, a banded sea crate. And these are so fun. They might seem intimidating at first, but actually most of the time when you see them, they're hunting and they want nothing to do with divers, people. They're just going about their business, sticking their head in holes, looking for prey, looking for stuff they can eat. Um, and if you're lucky and you see them from far enough away, you can tend to get in front of them and then get those head on shots as they're swimming through the water. And you're not disturbing them because they'll go around you under wherever they wanna go. They're not too worried. They're just gonna keep hunting. So little tip there. Um, and then some sun rays too. When you're shooting up like this in portrait orientation, makes it a lot easier to get detail in the reef as well as to get a sunball or some sun rays into the scene. Okay, so those are our wide angle tips. So now let's look at the histogram. Um, and basically the histogram here is what I use to determine whether I have correct exposure in the scene. Now it's, there's so much to talk about. But in general, the way the histogram works is that it relays the, the exposure info of your scene. Now your camera, you can see this in your camera. If you use Adobe Lightroom, you can see that in Lightroom. You can open it up in Photoshop as well. Um, but in your camera, depending on what you have, you may see some of these color channels, but you can disregard those. Don't worry about that. They may be in one grid, they may be in multiple grids, but we're going to look at this gray bar right here. And that's showing us the exposure of the scene. And what you want is you want this gray area, could be white in your camera, 
to appear in the middle of the histogram. Now on the left side, the far left is the black point. Anything happening outside of that is going to be pitch black with no pixel data. It's, there's going to be nothing there to, to recover or show detail in your image. On the far right side is the white point. So that is the extreme overexposure side of the image where your pixels turn white and there's no data in the white. There's something called in-camera highlight alerts. And if you have those on, whether it's in camera or whether it's in Lightroom or your post-processing software, you can actually see flashing indicating where you've got that extreme underexposure and extreme overexposure where the data is lost. So the goal is to be between those two bars. Ansel Adams actually has a seven zone system for a proper exposure for black and white, but same thing applies to color. So in the middle, we've got our perfect exposure. Then we've got the shadow areas and then the dark and the black areas. Over here, we get a little more uh, exposed, a little brighter. So we've got some of the, the highlights and then the whites, just the brightest areas. So as you're shooting each image, you want to be, be shoot, shooting your image, whether it's macro or wide angle, and then hit the image review button. And then once you're looking at your image in image review, hit the playback or that info button, and you can toggle through the different options there. So you'll see the big image, and then you'll see an image with some of the, the settings data, and then you'll see the image probably very small with the histogram next to it and maybe some other info. But that histogram is key to telling you the, if the exposure is correct or not. Um, in this one, I can tell you right off the bat that this was a macro shot. Well, because of the settings, F25 and 1 200th of a second. But basically, a lot of the detail in the subject here, the reds, the yellows, and greens are all on the right side here. And then this blue is back here. So this is going to be a darker area of the reef sort of thing. And this is the detail of the subject. Um, when we start to look at some of the other examples of the histogram, in this example here, look at how the, the gray and all the data of the exposure is slammed to the left right there. Um, that means the image is too dark. We want the exposure to be somewhere in the center like this one. So as I go back and I review my image as I'm setting up the shot and say, oh, the histogram slammed to the left. I need to make this image brighter. So I know right off the bat I need to do that. Maybe I can look at a different one and see everything slammed to the right. And then I will say, you know what? Maybe I need to make this image a little darker to get that correct exposure. Now, of course, you can correct exposure when you're editing and post-processing. But the thing is, if you, you do have that, that um, ability to adjust the exposure by one or two stops, but if you're using that latitude in editing just to correct the image and make it a correct image, you've lost the ability to really maximize editing. And by that, I mean, when you have the correct exposure, you can now darken shadows, you can lighten highlights, you can lighten shadows, you can do all this different stuff and really create much more custom contrast if your exposure is correct to begin with. But if you've used all that editing leeway and now you're starting to get noise in the shadows because it was too dark and you're now making it brighter so it's a proper exposure and then you also want to, to start playing around with more of the color or color in the shadows and things, you're just limited because you've already adjusted so much in those areas. So by getting the exposure correct, you have all that ability there. These are just some examples of the histogram. Very dark, slope to the left, proper exposure, very much in the middle and then overexposed. So you've got the data all to the right. Um, so with that, I want to open it up. Um, if anyone has any questions, please leave them in the chat. Um, would love to, uh, to answer questions. Um, if you have them now, type them in. Otherwise, I will be hanging out at the Atlantis booth. Um, so jump over to the expo section and uh, just type in Atlantis. You can navigate over to our booth and I'll be there on video chat um, for the next few minutes and there to answer questions. If you have anything personal um, or any personal questions there. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for joining. Hope you're having a fun time. And um, yeah, we will uh, we'll see you over in the Atlantis booth. We'll hang out a few more seconds here for, uh, for any questions. And here's an example when you nail that exposure. And actually, since we do have uh, a minute or two left, I believe, um, one of the tricky things with the histogram or one of the reasons you want to use the histogram is on night dives. Think about when you're looking at your cell phone and it's very dark and your screen is set to the brightest setting. It seems like everything's way too bright. So you turn it all the way down. But if you keep that screen all the way down and then you walk into a bright room, you can't see anything on your phone unless you brighten the screen. So when you're on a dark night dive, 
and you think you've got this great exposed image because it's glowing very brightly on your LCD screen, what happens is you put on the computer and it might be two, three stops underexposed, but you were in such a dark environment you couldn't tell because it seemed bright. But the histogram is data and the data doesn't lie and it will always guide you on your way to exposure. So that's why I'm such a big fan of using it. Okay, let's check our some comments here. Okay, well, again, you know, guys, thank you so much for joining. I think we're down to ooh, about a minute here if there are any questions. Um, but these are just some of the highlights where we dive with Atlantis. Of course, the two resorts at Dumaguete, Porta Galera. Then we've got uh, Tubataha Reef, which is stunning. Just, you know, definitely a top five, top 10 uh, dive destination worldwide. One of those bucket list trips. I hate to use that term, but it is one of those things. Um, let's see. Okay. It looks like I was on the wrong tab here. So I know, guys, I apologize for that. But please find me in the Atlantis booth um, in case we get cut off here. And um, I will be able to answer some of the questions. Um, so quickly, for white balance, I leave white balance in auto. It's so much easier. If you're shooting in raw, you can adjust white balance in post a little bit. And you won't degrade the image or any of the image quality. And that's no problem there. Um, and that's the main one. So every once in a while, uh, there's certain strobe and camera combinations that will always shoot warm for macro or, or too cool. And there's different strobe um, filters and stuff like that that will change the color balance, the color temp. But I always leave it as auto. Video would be different. Then I would manually white balance. OK, um, red filters and how to make the critters stay still. So thank you for that, Sarah. Um, so I do not generally use red filters. Um, and this, uh, I can talk for a while here on this one. But essentially, um, if you are close to your subject, so when we're shooting macro, you're going to be lighting the subject with your artificial light, your video light, or your strobe light. So there is uh, there's no reason to have a red filter plus your strobe light or your video light. You'll probably get a red tint when you're shooting um, with a, an artificial light and a red filter. Um, but what happens is with those artificial lights, you're going to get better color and contrast than using a red filter. Um, for wide angle scenes, if it's a bright, clear, sunny day with clear water, you've got the sun at your back, then a red filter will do well, um, as long as you just don't have a subject in close. So if you're shooting a big scene, maybe a shallow reef that's at, you know, three, four meters, you know, 10, 12, 15 feet, that sort of thing would be... Um, you know, really nice. You get a little deeper, maybe 30 to 60 feet, put on that red filter. It'll look really nice. Of course, if you're shooting something in that blue water, like a shark that comes close, you may want to opt for strobes or video lights because you've got that close subject. It may come out a little better um, than using the red filter. So hope that answers that question. Um, critters staying still, you need to know their language. They're a very secret language. Um, but no, they, every critter's different and some are going to be skittish. Um, my friend Mike Bardick actually had a tip um, that said, you know, you keep looking at stuff and if all the gobies swim away, finally you find one that stays put, take advantage of it. Maybe you found the, uh, the dumbest goby in the world, hate to use that term, but if it wants to stay put, let you shoot, take advantage, spend that whole dive shooting your goby shots because you know that the rest are gonna swim away from you. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind when you do find a cooperative subject or for me, when I find a subject like a nudibranch perched on something high, I will take my time and shoot that um, as much as I can. You know, I know that's in a great composition. And if I know I'm not don't have too much of that in the portfolio from the trip, I'm going to try and, and shoot a lot of those to make sure I nailed one or two great ones because that nudibranch is in such a good position. So I guess the tip is is trying to find the subjects that don't run away from you because if they do, there's not much you can do. Um, for seahorses, I try to always shoot those without a focus light, which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, depends how bright the water is and if the camera can focus. But uh, seahorses tend to turn away from the light and they just don't like it. Um, so they'll often face you if you, you turn off your light and sort of surprise them that way. Then again, now you're blasting a light on them, they're not aware, but uh, you know they might be looking at you at that point. Um, I guess I can keep going here, um, but basically, uh, what was I going to say? For big subjects, too, getting them to, to interact 
um, what you can do is, is try and rile them up. So sea lions are one of my favorite subjects. Dolphins like this too. I mean, these are mammals that you can connect with. You're probably not going to connect with a little crab on an emotional, intelligent being level, but sea lions, mammals, whales, dolphins, um, all this type of stuff you can connect with. I mean, little sea lion pups, I'll get them excited. I'll, I'll take a little, little toy, like a wristband, and um, I will start waving that around. And they think it's the most fun dog toy ever, puppy toy. And they come in close, they swim. I put it away and I shoot my photos while they're engaged. Once they get bored and swim off, I bring it back. I get myself very exciting and they come back in and we're engaging and that creates that interest. If it's something like dolphins, be in there, be in their space, make that eye contact, put your camera down for the first three minutes you're in the water because then the dolphins will play, they'll swim the way you swim and they'll engage. And then when you pull up the camera and you swim with them, they're, you're already connected and you're, you've got part of this game. So that's a huge tip is just to, to you know, get on the level with the marine life, connect with them and you're gonna get better shots as a result, absolutely. So I think that is pretty much it. So we're gonna to move to the booth here. And um, if you guys have more questions, I'll see you in the Atlantis booth. But uh, thanks for joining us.